Bitcoin possesses all the attributes, not only of good money, but of supremely good money. Replacing fiat currency with fiat digital currency is not an improvement. If you want a market-based system of money that doesn't get shut down when it grows past the size of a novelty, it has to be decentralized. Bitcoin is, yeah, it's divisible, it's portable, it's, you know, it's all these things. But apart from the fact that it can be utilized in transaction, it's nothing. Nothing has intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is a meaningless term because value has to be subjective in the eyes of the valuer. The bottom's gonna drop out of the market like all bubbles and everyone's gonna wanna sell. There's gonna be no demand, there's gonna be massive supply. The whole thing is gonna implode. Welcome uh, now to the main event. Uh, arguing for the affirmative on the resolution, we have Shapeshift CEO, Eric Voorhees. Eric, please come to the stage. All right, arguing for the negative, we have Euro Pacific Capital CEO, Peter Schiff. Peter, please come to the stage. A very raucous crowd. You, uh, Peter, please sit up there. <laughs> I don't want you guys near each other. This is a raucous crowd. And, and I have to sit between you. Uh, and, uh, and as you know, the resolution. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Pass the gentleman. So, oh, that's very nice. Okay. You guys get in. Okay. Please, uh, the, the resolution, as you know, is Bitcoin or a similar form of cryptocurrency will eventually replace government's fiat money as the preferred medium of exchange. Uh, Eric Voorhees, please take the podium and defend that resolution. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Voorhees. I'm the founder and CEO of Shapeshift, which is a leading digital asset exchange. It's available nearly everywhere in the world other than here in New York because New York is quietly suffocating under a depressing pall of statism. <laughs> the question of who's more socialist, New York or China, would perhaps be a good topic for a Soho debate. <laughs> I'd like to thank Gene Epstein in the forum for hosting the debate. I would also like to thank Peter for agreeing to spar with me here this evening. Peter is someone that I've looked up to for a very long time. Back in 2008, prior to Bitcoin, I listened to Peter's podcasts every day uh, while driving to work. Much of what I've learned about money and economics came from him. So Peter, thank you for all that you have taught me over the years. Oh, you're so smart. <laughs> and thank you especially for agreeing to take the position of defending fiat currency tonight, for Lord knows that I never would. <laughs> tonight I make the case that Bitcoin or a similar form of cryptocurrency will eventually replace government fiat as a preferred means of exchange. I'll use the term Bitcoin loosely here to refer to any such cryptocurrency that accomplishes that goal. I'm going to construct the argument in four pieces. First, why Bitcoin is good money. Second, why fiat is bad money. Third, why gold or other forms of market-based money are insufficient. Fourth, why Bitcoin will win. So first, why is Bitcoin good money? As we all know, mankind has used many different things as money. Monies come and go, and the adoption of one monetary standard over another is the rule rather than the exception throughout history. But a society's choice of money is not arbitrary. There are certain attributes of money which seem preferable to others. Gold scores highly on these attributes, which is why it has remained an indelible monetary standard for millennia. To assess Bitcoin's likelihood of assuming the monetary throne for the next period of human history, one must first understand its attributes. First, I'll point out that Bitcoin possesses all the attributes not only of good money, but of supremely good money. It is not marginally better than alternatives, rather it is in its own league entirely. First, Bitcoin is provably scarce. There are only 21 million of them, and there can never be more. I can tell you exactly how many there will be tomorrow. The answer is 17,130,620. I can tell you the supply a year from now and 10 years from now. Let's see any central bank attempt such a feat. And yet while scarce, Bitcoin is easily divisible. One Bitcoin can be cut into 100 million pieces and recombined at will. In terms of divisibility, Bitcoin wins hands down over both fiat and gold. Bitcoin is also durable. A Bitcoin exists as a ledger entry, backed up on thousands of computers around the world. Certainly, if the internet went down, you'd be unable to use Bitcoin, but that is also true of your credit cards, PayPal, 
banks, and any other form of modern money. So Bitcoin is at no disadvantage to fiat in this regard. Bitcoin is fungible. Each Bitcoin is worth the same as every other. It is recognizable. Every Bitcoin wallet can quickly attest whether a Bitcoin is legitimate or not. A Bitcoin cannot be counterfeited. Unlike with gold, it cannot be filled with tungsten. And as one of its greatest attributes, Bitcoin is highly portable. You can send it anywhere on Earth for very little cost. It moves across borders with ease. It has no concept of borders. It has no weight. It has no smell. It has no physical body that can be blocked or apprehended. Indeed, it is the only form of money today which can be moved at distance without trusting a third party. It is the only money that doesn't require permission from an overseer. Therefore, it is the only money appropriate for free people. Finally, Bitcoin also possesses an important attribute which will one day be seen as critical for good money, programmability. Bitcoin can be programmed to enable all kinds of economic activity, often without a middleman, escrow agent, or human arbitration of any kind. This programmability without having to trust anyone is impossible with fiat, and in a digital age will come to be one of its most important advantages. Next, let's discuss why fiat is bad money. <laughs> why should we care about cryptocurrencies and their attributes when we already have fiat? Fiat works pretty well, right? It's got pyramids and government buildings printed on it, so you know it's valuable. <laughs> also, it is backed by paper. Paper can be burned if you're cold in the winter. There's its intrinsic value. Try that with gold. <laughs> but a skeptical observer should know that fiat money is an absolute scam and something altogether inappropriate for an ethical market-based society. As I like to say, you cannot have a free market when the most important good, money itself, is centrally planned and controlled. Fiat money and a market economy are mutually exclusive concepts. Like oil and water, they can certainly be mixed up together when force is applied, but they will naturally separate and dispel one another over time. Indeed, the average lifespan of fiat is less than 50 years. The US dollar only became fiat in 1971. That's less than the length of William Shatner's career. <laughs> and as it happened, last week he announced that he has started to mine bitcoins as well. Regardless, when examining its specific properties as money, most ways, fiat is unimpressive. First, it is not scarce. It is systematically created out of thin air, with no limit on supply, nor can supply even be known. Fiat is willed into existence by politicians and banks because printing money enriches the printer at the expense of the public who holds the previously printed money. The phenomenon is known as inflation, inflation or currency debasement. Fiat also struggles with durability. Your fiat will only last so long as your bank permits and even then it slowly loses its value. Your bank can destroy your fiat with the click of a button. Ask a Cypriot. Ask an Argentinian how durable fiat is. With fiat, you are ever dependent on a third party with your wealth. Is that an attribute of money that you find attractive? Some people are comfortable with it because they trust their government, but requiring trust in politicians seems a poor foundation upon which to build a prosperous society. Finally, fiat is not nearly as portable as Bitcoin. Try to send an international wire right now. You can't because it's after five o'clock. How quaint is that? You can try tomorrow morning as long as it's not Sunday because apparently God doesn't want you to use the financial system on the Sabbath. <laughs> but even when successful, you'll discover it takes three to five days for your wire to arrive. You often have to physically go to the bank to do this. You have to fill out a form on paper while someone making $15 an hour takes that info and types it back into a computer. Why do people put up with this nonsense? Indeed, it is faster to strash, strap cash to an anvil and FedEx it to Tokyo than it is to send an international wire. Do you really think that that system is going to outcompete Bitcoin in an open marketplace? And you can only send fiat if you have permission. Try to send it to a family member in Russia. You'll be censored. Want to donate to a relief effort, perhaps, in Venezuela? Too bad, you'll be censored. Are you sending a suspicious amount? Your payment will be blocked, and you better get ready for questioning or outright confiscation. Yep. The Orwellian nanny state is alive and well, and fiat currency is one of its most insidious tentacles. Fiat has these poor monetary attributes because it is a tool and appendage of the state. It exists to serve the state, not to exist market participants. Its attributes as money are intentionally constrained and inferior so as to siphon wealth to the state through debasement and to surveil and control the behavior of the king's subjects. Remember that fiat means value by decree, not by merit. So why are gold and other alternatives insufficient? I love gold. 
I own gold, and I would like to own more gold. I understand why gold is good money, and Peter has done a great job of teaching such concepts to the public. But gold, as a, as a physical heavy commodity, cannot be efficiently used as money at scale. Imagine trying to run payroll with physical gold coins. Try to make change for a pizza with bullion, and forget about payment at strip clubs. Bruising women is not cool. Unless you're the New York Attorney General Snyderman. <laughs> Suffice to say that gold, when in physical form, is impractical for commerce. For gold to work in a modern economy, it must be warehoused by a company. And then digital certificates or credits must be issued against that gold. Those digital certificates could theoretically work well as money in a modern economy, except for one problem, centralization. A digital gold payment service or any privately issued market-based money requires some form of centralized control or custody, and thus exposes users to counterparty risk. This is fatal, because if such a private company ever grows to scale, a government could shut it down, unplug its servers, arrest its principles, and seize its assets. This exact thing happened with eGold, and another company, Gold Money, was so scared of this happening that they stopped allowing payments of digital gold between customers entirely. Private money, when centralized, probably cannot attain scale and thus cannot surpass fiat because the government won't allow it. So why will Bitcoin win? Bitcoin will win because there is now competition in money, and Bitcoin is the best money currently available. Because it's decentralized, it cannot be stopped. It doesn't happen all at once. Nobody switches immediately from fiat and banks to Bitcoin and blockchains. Rather, Bitcoin will simply, gradually, come to be used as an occasional alternative to fiat. Individuals will find specific times and places in which it is easier, faster, safer, or cheaper to use Bitcoin to store or transfer wealth than to use credit cards or banks. Indeed, two billion people in the world don't even have credit cards or banks. For them, the choice will be easy. Yet despite the failings of the legacy system, Bitcoin now imbues every human on Earth with financial sovereignty. With Bitcoin, anyone of any age, race, or creed, no matter which imaginary lines they were born within, and nothing more than a $50 smartphone, can send and receive money anywhere in the world instantly at near zero cost, and there isn't a goddamn thing that anyone else in the world can do to stop that. It is one of the most potent tools of individual empowerment ever invented, and it is happening right in front of us. Fiat now persists solely on the momentum of, the momentum of tradition. The older generations may cling to it for quite some time, but they and their ways are dying, and their wealth decays in front of them, debased openly by the very people they worship, salute, and vote into office. Someday, school children will laugh and joke with each other as they learn about the silly flag paper with cultish incantations inscribed on it, <laughs> which, in yet another of history's examples of mass delusion, people thought to be valuable. Or maybe they won't laugh and joke because they will have learned how much destruction it actually caused. Maybe fiat will be looked at more like medieval blood lettering, a dark symptom of human ignorance that is so obviously foolish in hindsight. Fiat will fall in time, and in its place, true decentralized market-based money will emerge. The profit motive alone will lead capital gradually away from those assets which can be debased and censored to those which cannot. To future generations, it will appear as inevitable as the collapse of serfdom, and for the very same reason. This is why Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency will eventually replace government fiat. Take the podium, Peter, arguing for the negative. Take it away, Peter. Yeah, thank you, uh, Gene, for inviting me here. Soho Forum, Reason. I, you know, I worked with Reason on uh, the uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street video that I did. And Eric, thanks uh, for dressing nicer than Max Kaiser, who was my, the last Bitcoin debate that I did. And I, you know, I, I wish you could have perva persuaded me to buy Bitcoin a few years ago. But um, you know, don't confuse the fact that financially, Bitcoin has been a success for a lot of people who happen to get into it early with whether or not it's ultimately going to succeed at replacing uh, the dollar or any other fiat currency as, as money. And I'm not here to defend the, the fiat-based monetary system that exists today. I agree with Eric, it is going to fail. And I believe a currency crisis is headed for us. I just don't believe that the future is Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is going to succeed uh, where the dollar or other fiat currencies fail. And to understand 
money. You have to understand its origins and, 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 and what it's uh, attempting to do. I mean, before the dollar was a fiat currency, it was a legitimate currency. And what is a legitimate currency? It's a currency that's actually backed by real money. In the case of the dollar, that real money was gold. Gold backed the dollar. And what gave the dollar value was the gold that backed it up. So nobody wanted dollars. Dollars were just a more convenient way of transacting in gold. And you know, before governments began issuing currency, private banks issued currency backed by, by gold. Again, the private currency simply facilitated gold transactions. Like, you know, I guess at the strip club, it's easier to put a, a bill in a stripper than a, a gold coin, right? So it made it easier. But, but the stripper is still earning the gold. That's what they wanted. And, you know, and then, and then before they had paper money, um, they just had gold coins, right? Gold was, you just, you know, had gold coins. And, you know, coins were an improvement over just nuggets, right? Gold bullion. Why, why were coins better? Because if the coin was made from a mint that you recognize, you knew exactly how much gold was in that coin. And why is that important? Well, because gold was a commodity, right? And if you are exchanging goods or services for gold, you want to know how much gold you're getting. Because that's, you know, it's the weight of gold that's important. How much gold am I getting for whatever it is that, that I am selling, right? And, and, and before they had gold, we had barter, right? Everybody just had to trade one product for another product. Gold, money, the invention of money, right, made commerce much more efficient. And of course, gold was not the only money. It wasn't the first money, but it was the best money. And Eric did an excellent job of going over a lot of the characteristics that gold had that made it more efficient as money, other than, let's say, cattle or wheat or oil. Those are commodities, but they, they don't work as well uh, as money. Gold worked beautifully as money, which is why more and more uh, societies adopted it as money. And what Bitcoin did very successfully is it managed to replicate a lot of those properties that gold had that made it so successful as money. In fact, they created Bitcoin to resemble gold, right? If you look at a picture of Bitcoin, not that it actually exists, but the way they tried to uh, you know, present it on a piece of paper, it's always the color of gold. It looks like a gold coin with a B in the middle of it. How do you create Bitcoins? Well, you mine them. I mean, there's no picks, there's, there's no real mining, but they just called it mining because they wanted to make it sound like you were creating digital gold. Right? But the reason that I have referred to it as being fool's gold is because Bitcoin is replicating all of the properties of gold except the most important one, and that's the metal itself, the element, the rare, scarce element that has been valued as a commodity for thousands of years. The reason people wanted gold as money is because it was a luxury good that people wanted. If you didn't want it yourself, somebody else wanted it. You can do all sorts of things with gold other than spend it, right? It's the actual uses, the physical properties. And it's not just the fact that gold is in jewelry, right? That's the most important use, but gold is in all the cell phones that we have. They use it in aerospace, they use it in medicine. I mean, and there's a lot of places that gold would be used, but they don't use it because they use other metals instead that are less expensive. But if they could afford gold, they would use it because gold would do a better job. Right, the best teeth, you want to get a crown, it's, there's, there's gold in it. If you want to save money, then you use something else. But if you want the best, you're going to have gold in there. And so there's real value there. On the other hand, Bitcoin is, yeah, it's divisible, it's portable, it's, you know, it's all these things. But apart from the fact that it can be utilized in transaction, it's nothing. It has no real value into itself as a commodity. There's no way to relate the price of Bitcoin to the price of anything else. I mean, you have thousands of years of history to know how much gold should be worth in terms of oil or wheat or any other commodity or whatever you're doing. But Bitcoin, there's no reference point. It's only existed for nine years. You know, nobody, it never had any value other than as a medium of exchange. There is this supposed 21 million unit scarcity, which is a self-imposed scarcity. The only reason it's scarce is because they created it to be scarce, except it's not scarce, uh, because Bitcoin can be forked off as many times as you want. There's Bitcoin cash, there's Bitcoin gold, whatever. Meanwhile, 
There's another 1,500 or so cryptocurrencies that can do everything Bitcoin could do. Some of them could do it better, faster, cheaper. There's no limit to the number of other digital currencies that can be created. There's only one gold. There'll never be another gold. Yeah, there are other metals on the periodic table, but they're not gold. They're not exactly the same as gold, but you can make as many cryptocurrencies that are exactly the same as Bitcoin. They just have a different name, but they have the exact same properties, although they may have better properties. They may be cheaper or faster, but the biggest problem with Bitcoin and why it can never be used as money is because one of the most important functions of money is that it has to be a reliable store of value, not just a medium of exchange. Bitcoin could do that, although it's inefficient. You know, and I think at its peak when Bitcoin prices got up to 20000 it was something like, I don't know, 50 60 bucks just to spend one. So obviously, you know, you couldn't use it to buy a cup of coffee if, the, you know, the, it costs $60 to buy the $5 coffee. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it, it isn't that easy to use, but, you know, maybe if you're trying to buy a car, big payment. But the problem with it is there is no certainty as to its future value, right? You have no idea what Bitcoin is going to be worth from hour to hour, let alone day to day or year to year. In order for something to be money, you need to be able to price products in it you need to be able to negotiate contracts in it. I need to be able to borrow and lend in it. Right? I need to be able to buy insurance in it. None of these things can ever be done with Bitcoin because nobody knows what, if anything, it's going to be worth in the future. Even Eric doesn't know. Eric, you know, it could be worth a million or it could be worth nothing. That can't be money. You can't have a, a, a currency that has no reliable store of value. Now, you could say, well, same thing with fiat currency. Yeah. Fiat currencies have lost value over time slowly, and eventually they may collapse. But most people who transact in dollars or euros or in have complete confidence in their value. They may acknowledge that they will lose value slowly, but they accept that. And you have all of the, uh, the, the, the history of use. You have the socially accepted. I mean, you have prices. Everything is denominated in these local currencies. And even if they're losing value slowly, they're losing value slow enough that the market can still transact in it. But there is no way to transact in, in, in Bitcoin. And if you don't like fiat currency and you want to use something else, it is very easy to use gold. I mean, as Eric said, you can have a company like Gold Money, for example, that has been you know reinvented now more recently, now that Turk sold to uh, uh, Bitgold and they changed the name to Gold Money. But you can have gold on deposit and you can spend your gold uh, you could spend, you could transfer it very inexpensively to anybody who wants to accept it. You could break it down into grams, and you could buy a cup of coffee with it for less money than it would cost you to buy a cup of coffee using your Bitcoin. Sure, Eric says, well, you have to trust a third party. Well, people have been trusting third parties with gold for ever since gold's been money. I mean, it worked fine in 19th century America when people trusted third parties with their gold. I mean, Brinks is the third party that holds your gold at uh, gold money. They've never lost an ounce of gold since they've been storing it in their entire hundred some odd year history. Um, now, could the government come in and maybe confiscate their money? Well, they haven't done it before. I mean, in theory, any government can confiscate anything, but you know, they have gold stored all around the world. I mean, is every single government, you know, is Switzerland, is, is Hong Kong, is Dubai, is Australia, are all these governments gonna start seizing gold from every uh, depository? But the idea to think that governments can't ban Bitcoin if they don't want to? You don't think governments can criminalize the use of Bitcoin? You don't think they can, they can tell the banks that they regulate? You can't do business with anybody who's using Bitcoin? You can't exchange Bitcoin for any fiat currencies? They could put you in jail. They can, you know, they can make the penalty 10 years, 20 years in jail for getting caught with a Bitcoin. I mean, it's very easy for the government to criminalize it if they want to do it. I mean, I think they have more of a chance of criminalizing that than they would of owning gold. So I think in the end, I agree with Eric completely that the fiat monetary system that we have now is not going to work. But replacing fiat currency with fiat digital currency is not an improvement, right? It is still a fiat. What gives Bitcoin value? The only thing that gives it value is confidence. It's confidence that other people will accept it in the future. 
That's the same thing that gives the dollar value or that gives the euro or the yen, except with the dollar, you've got legal tender, you've got a whole banking system and a society that's built around it, and the government requires every American citizen to pay their taxes every year, and you have to pay it in dollars. So if you don't want to go to jail, you have to have dollars to pay your taxes. Nobody has to have bitcoins for anything. Right now, people want bitcoins because they think they're going to get rich. Why do they think they're going to get rich? Because they think the price is going to go up because they believe that one day it's going to be money. It's not money now. It's not being used as money now. It's being used as a speculative asset. But the speculation is that that's going to change in the future and that one day it'll be money. But that is a promise on which Bitcoin nor any other cryptocurrency is ever capable of delivering. So ultimately, if you want to go to the future, you got to go to the past. The future of money is gold. And if gold is going to be digitized, if we're going to have a gold-backed gold cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency backed by real money, just like the initial banknotes used to be backed by real money, then that can succeed. And that is the only type of cryptocurrency that can succeed. But all of the cryptocurrencies that exist today, whatever 1,500 of them that are backed by nothing, are no better than the, you know, the national cryptocurrencies that they're hoping to replace. Thank you. Rebuttal from Eric Voorhees. Uh, take the uh, podium, uh, Eric. Yeah. All right. So, Peter covered a lot of topics. I will try to remember most of the points that he was making and address some of them. Um, first of all, I think we should cover for a second this idea that, that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. Um, this is a word, this intrinsic value, that I think a lot of Austrians have struggled with for quite some time. Nothing has intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is a meaningless term because value has to be subjective in the eyes of the valuer. Something that you think is intrinsically valuable, for example, like water, because all of us have to drink it, is only valuable if there's a human there that's thirsty. If there's a human there that's not thirsty, the water is not valuable at all. Before humans roamed the earth, gold had zero value whatsoever. There was no species or no sentient life that thought that that mineral was valuable to them. So value is subjective. Value comes when the person doing the valuing finds a good reason or purpose for that thing to use. This is true of gold. This is true of Bitcoin. Second, if there is such a thing as intrinsic value for the sake of argument, Bitcoin's intrinsic value, in this sense, comes from its payment network. And Satoshi did a injustice, I think, to the system by calling both the payment network itself and the unit of account, the currency, both have the name of Bitcoin. The payment network is the only way in the world that you can send a transaction to someone else in a decentralized way where no one can stop it, between any two people on Earth, no border whatsoever, it cannot be censored, and it is really cheap to actually do it. If that isn't valuable, then I don't, I don't know what is. Now, you may say it's not worth the price that Bitcoins are going for today, and that would be a valid argument. But to say that that system, which was the first in history to allow two people at distance to transact with each other, is not valuable, flies in the face of reason. Second. Let's talk about volatility for a second. Uh, you are totally right that Bitcoin's current volatility would make it a very poor use of day-to-day -day money today. I will see that point absolutely. But volatility is not an aspect of Bitcoin which is intrinsic to it. In other words, volatility is what happens when the market is trying to decide on its value. Bitcoin is new, it is small, over time, it will achieve stability, just as it has. When I got involved in 2011, it would move 50% in a day. Today, it's a big deal when it moves 10%. And I think 10 years from now, it'll be a big deal when it moves 2 or 3%. Stability as a market asset is earned with time. You cannot design something to be stable. So while Bitcoin is definitely too volatile today, I think that problem is, is self-correcting. Um, next, I want to address the, the multiple coins as inflation argument, which is that Bitcoin's not really scarce because there's, there's all sorts of coins that can be replicated from it. 
Um, just as gold is scarce, and I can't make the claim that there are other metals and thus gold is not scarce, I don't think that you can make the claim that just because there are other cryptos that that means Bitcoin is not scarce. You can copy the code, but the code is not the network. You cannot copy the hash power of the miners. You cannot copy the infrastructure of all the wallets and all the companies that operate on the Bitcoin network. You cannot copy the, the brand, actually. You cannot copy that reputation that Bitcoin has earned uh, in time. And we don't need to debate this on a theoretical level. We have actually seen this happening. So when we last debated, Peter, um, a few years ago in late 2013, there was about $10 billion as the entire market cap of Bitcoin. And all the alts, everything other than Bitcoin put together was about $1 billion. According to your theory, if more blockchains happened and more alts came out, um, and more money even went into those alts, the market cap of Bitcoin itself should decline. Yet what we've seen is that alts have exploded. They're now $150 billion in value. And Bitcoin also has increased in value. It's now $110 billion in market cap. So if it was true that more coins and blockchains would debase the value of Bitcoin, the market cap of Bitcoin should be far less than it is today. Um, and this doesn't have to be a mystery to anyone. A clone of Bitcoin's code is not a clone of Bitcoin. Um, and then the last thing. So you, I think, are suggesting again that gold is really the way to have a modern society based on honest money. I would absolutely prefer that the world use gold uh, than to use fiat. And I, again, am a big fan of gold, and I understand why it's valuable and why it's useful. But the point remains that it is not practical for commerce unless you are trusting some counterparty. And you, of all people, Peter, know that governments will not allow something to compete with their form of value if they can stop it. So. If you want a market-based system of money that doesn't get shut down when it grows past the size of a novelty, it has to be decentralized. It cannot have an individual person or company or vault that can be seized. If that's what you have, then you will never actually have a free market financial system because the government simply will not allow it. Gold indeed was confiscated in the 30s. This is not some crazy idea. And even though gold worked very well in 19th century America, People weren't doing online commerce in 19th century America. The world has changed to some degree. It doesn't mean that the principles of money have changed, but it does mean that the form of money in today's economy that works the best may have changed. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it. All right, uh, a, couple of, a couple of points. Uh, first of all, let me try to go backwards. As far as the... Um, the argument of government shutting down a competition. And we know they do this, right? I mean, you know, they don't let people compete with the post office, but they allowed Federal Express, right? You know, a lot of, you know, Uber hasn't been shut down. I mean, that competes with government monopolies on taxi cabs. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think that governments are going to be too quick to shut down people transacting in gold. I do think that they're more likely uh, to crack down on Bitcoin, as I said before, and I think it's easier. I mean, there's not that much anonymity in it. I mean, I've, I've heard now that it's almost like a fingerprint. If you, you know, criminals are using Bitcoin to launder money, now all of a sudden, you know, it's actually a record of the transactions. The governments can go into the computers and kind of figure out, you know, where these transactions took place. I mean, if, if I just hand gold to somebody, I mean, it's like handing cash. Uh, so I think ultimately, if the government's going to try to put a stop to anything, it, they're more likely to, to put a stop to cryptocurrencies. I think one of the reasons they're not doing it is because I think they pretty much realize they're going to fail. Um, as far as the argument about the market cap, and I acknowledged early on, I wish I'd have listened to you earlier and bought some Bitcoin. The, the price of anything is a function of supply and demand. And even though the supply of cryptocurrencies has exploded, massive inflation, the demand has grown even faster. And so as long as demand is rising faster than supply, price can go up. The problem is what happens when all the demand goes away? So you said earlier that you know exactly what the supply of Bitcoin is going to be later next year, next week, whatever, maybe fine. But do you know what the demand is going to be? There may be no demand. I believe that the majority of the demand is coming from speculators who are buying it because they want to sell it to somebody else. Everybody who's buying Bitcoin ultimately wants to sell it to buy something real. 
Nobody wants a Bitcoin, right? They want what they can buy when they sell their Bitcoin. But no one wants to sell it now. Everybody's holding on or hodling you know, because it's, it's going to a million, right? So nobody wants to sell. No one wants to be the idiot that gets out. But at some point, the bottom's going to drop out of the market like all bubbles, and everyone's going to want to sell. There's going to be no demand. There's going to be massive supply. The whole thing is going to implode, which gets down to the concept of intrinsic value. And I disagree that it's impossible to have intrinsic value. And when I'm talking about intrinsic value, what I'm referring to is what you can do with the money absent its utilization as a medium of exchange or store of value. Right? There are things that I can do with gold. Right? There are actual things that you can do with it that you can't use other metals because they're not a good substitute because they don't share the properties of gold. Gold is very unique among metals. And there are a lot of things that you can do with it. I mean, obviously, too, I mean, if you use cattle as money, you, yeah, you can eat the cattle, right? I mean, you get, you know, there are things you could do with it. But there is nothing you can do with your Bitcoin. That is the point on the lack of intrinsic value. If I don't have somebody who wants it, there is absolutely no actual demand for it. There is real demand for gold that always will exist absent its, its functioning uh, as money. And so that gives it a, a f real floor. There's actual some tangible use. Sure, I mean, there's this big network of people that accept Bitcoin. So what? I mean, how many people have MySpace accounts? Right? That was a network. All right, well, Facebook came along. Oh, it was better. I mean, what's the odds? Think about all the technologies that we have today. You know, does anybody have the first cell phone ever made? Anyone have the first camera? The first television? The first automobile? No. Right? Someone comes up with a better one. So what's the odds that Bitcoin is the best cryptocurrency that's ever going to be invented? You know? And so if, if it can be easily replaced by something that's better, because you know, if, you, if you look at what, what you can do with it, well, I could do the same thing with any other cryptocurrency. But the problem is, even if there's a cryptocurrency now that's better than Bitcoin, and there probably are many, there are other ones that have yet to be devised that will be better than those. And so the problem is you can't use it as money. You can't store it just like I, you know, I, I couldn't use the first cell phone as money or I couldn't use the first you know, car. All these products are losing value in the market as somebody comes up with something better to replace it. Right? Gold, nobody's come up with a better gold. There are thousands of years, people, you know, people tried to make gold and they've succeeded, alchemists. You know, so we know that's real money. Right? But these cryptocurrencies without any real value. Now you say, well, you can make the argument, well, Peter, the dollar has no intrinsic value. It doesn't, that's right. But what it has is the power of the state and it has the, 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 the history of use. I mean, the fact that it used to be backed by gold and now it's not. I mean, the government's watered down our monetary system gradually over time. So we started with all this trust because we weren't just trusting anything because the paper money was backed by gold. But slowly the government went off the gold standard and debased our money and the dollar's been losing value steadily and slowly over the last hundred years. I mean, eventually it's gonna collapse and you know, it'll go away, um, but it's a slow process. But I think Bitcoin and all these cryptocurrencies, it's gonna be a big process. Because again, right now, let's say the top was 20,000. I think there's a good chance that the market's topped out. Now, how long is it gonna take before it zeroes out? I don't know. There's a lot of trading going on. People are buying and selling. I don't think there's any um, real capitulation yet. I don't think any of the long-term Bitcoin holders are scared that Bitcoin went down 70%, especially if they've been in it for a long time. But there's a big difference between when your market cap is as high as it is now and you have a 70% drop than when it went from a dollar to, to 30 cents, you know, when people lost their lunch money. Now you got people with their IRA money. You got people with big amounts of money in, in Bitcoin that got suckered into this mania between 10,000 and 20,000. And I think that, yeah, right now, Bitcoin's got a lot going for it because you got all these kids that are now, you know, millionaires driving their, their Lambos, right? <laughs> and Everybody else has to tune out all the FUD, right? You know, you know, you know, you, you don't want to, you know, because they're afraid of missing out all the FOMO, right? They, they, you know. and but once, once the market crashes and you get the horror stories of people that mortgaged their house and took out credit card loans to buy Bitcoin and now they lost their life savings, right? All of a sudden, all the stories of instant riches are going to be replaced by stories of 
big losses, and now the brand is tarnished, and now you've destroyed. Like a lot of these people that bought Bitcoin at 10, 15,000, when they sell out at a loss, they ain't coming back, right? That's gonna be, so you destroy your market, you destroy the brand, and all this demand is gone, and all you've got left is the supply. Not just the supply of Bitcoins, but all the altcoins that were created during the mania, and all that malinvestment that built up in industries to, to, to cultivate to it, it's all gonna come crashing down, just like every other bubble. Um, thank you, guys. Uh, we are now going to the Q&A part of the evening. Uh, Don Smith, a big Bitcoin bear, uh, do you have uh, the first question to ask? Uh, take it away, Don. Yeah, hand it back to Don, yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, guys. It was a good debate. <clears throat> um, I just, I wanted just uh, to point out, I looked at the definition of a, um, uh, fiat currency, and it's a currency that's not backed by anything tangible, and a commodity currency is a currency that's backed by something tangible or a commodity. So I think it's kind of funny that we're debating uh, how bad fiat currency is when Bitcoin, by definition, is a fiat currency. Um, the other thing I would point out, so by definition, you have to vote uh, no on the uh, on the uh, debate. Um, I also uh, point out that um, you know you can't really buy anything with a fiat with um, a Bitcoin right now to speak of. I mean, there's a few places, but and when people talk about hiding money or avoiding taxes, well, anytime you want to buy something, you still got to run it through a bank. I mean, when you sell your Bitcoin, where you have the cash sent to, it's got to go to a bank somewhere. So I don't think it's a very effective way of hiding money or I don't even know why criminals would use it because I don't, they have to run it through a bank. So maybe you can explain that to me. Another, I'd like to tell a story. I have a friend who, his wife came in and he said, honey, I didn't want to tell you this, but about seven years ago, I took all the money out of our piggy bank and I bought uh, Bitcoin. And he said, really? He said, yeah. And it just hit 19,000 and we want the good news. The good news is we're worth $70 million. And he couldn't believe it. She said, the bad news is, I don't know where the code is to get the money. <laughs> and I don't, and to this day, I keep asking him, did you ever find the code? And he hasn't found it. It's so a true I, story, Don, right? It's that's a true, a true story. It's a true story, yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, so I want to know, where'd that $70 million go? I mean, who got it? And the uh, other thing is, yeah. how do you, uh, what's that? Um, how do you, you know, a Bitcoin does take a lot to manufacture. I mean, you gotta buy semiconductor parts, you gotta use a lot of electricity, so you can spend a lot of money to create wealth, except when you're done, there's nothing tangible. So you, you spend money to get rich. Okay, Don, uh, so I'm, I get it. Okay, right, so let's go. Don, you asked some very good questions. Uh, with all due respect, I wanna make one point, Don. The resolution reads that Bitcoin will eventually replace governments fiat money, that's the wording of the resolution. So it's government's fiat money we're talking about uh, in this particular case, for what that's worth. Thank you for your questions, okay. Don. Uh, you what, I, I think most of these challenge, look, you love Don, okay, Peter, but uh, most, of these, <laughs> most, most of these questions are challenges to Eric, so Eric, you get first responder response, go ahead. Yeah. Thank T you, Don. Testing, testing, yeah. is this on? Yeah, yeah it's on, yeah. Okay, so uh, regarding your friend, um, that's, <laughs> That's really tragic. I mean, if you want to know where that money went, it went to buy us all of our Lambos. <laughs> actually, in reality, the freedom that people actually get and the sovereignty over their money that they get with crypto comes with responsibility. Losing that code was that person's responsibility, and it really sucks, but this is why it's important to educate people on how to use Bitcoin instead of getting distracted by things like the price. Second, uh, you mentioned um, <laughs> you mentioned your definition of fiat being something that's not backed by a commodity. Um, I wonder if you get your definition of inflation also from that same dictionary, because I'm guessing that it's wrong. Fiat actually means value by decree. It comes from uh, anything that is valuable in a marketplace because some legal reason causes it to be valuable. Dollars are fiat now. 
when dollars were backed by gold, they were not fiat. Bitcoin's value, even if you think it is the most speculative and stupid investment in the universe, that value does not come from any decree. It comes from its desirability in an open marketplace. Bitcoin is absolutely not fiat. Um, next, you say that Bitcoin is not backed by anything. That's because Bitcoin itself is a commodity. Gold is also not backed by anything. It itself is a commodity that people will find useful for one thing or another. Bitcoin will, uh, is the same, and people will find it useful for one thing or another. So I, I think I addressed your main points on that. Yeah, just, yeah my couple of points on it. On, on, when it comes to fiat money, I mean, the, the, what, the, the, what Bitcoin has in common with fiat is even though a government didn't decree it as money, there's no law that requires anybody to accept it. What stands behind it is confidence and faith, that you, you certainly share a lot of confidence and faith in, in Bitcoin and its future. But I would argue that as a raw commodity, it has no actual utility, which brings me to a good point that I didn't get a chance to raise, and that is the incredible amount of resources in the form of energy that is required to create Bitcoin. I mean, one of the arguments that people can have against the gold standard is that look at how expensive it is to get gold out of the ground. And then if we're just going to stick it in another hole in the ground and no one's going to see it or use it, you know, it's an expensive way to run the monetary system. Now, I think those costs are small compared to the benefits of having sound money versus all the losses imposed by the fiat system. But if you're going to go to a cryptocurrency, at least find one that doesn't cost anything to create. I mean, why have to spend? It actually costs more money to mine a Bitcoin than an ounce of gold. And at least if I take that ounce of gold out of a vault, there is real value there. There's something I can do with that gold. I didn't waste all the resources mining it out of the earth. But the Bitcoin, once this Bitcoin bubble pops, all the electricity that was used to create those Bitcoins it was a complete waste. We didn't get anything of value from all those, those valuable resources that were expended. Uh, you know, and by the way, you mentioned William Shatner. You know what William Shatner is doing? He's got a power plant, and what he's doing is selling the power to the Bitcoin miners. He's not mining them himself. He's just selling these guys power so that they can keep on making bitcoins. Uh, but you know, eventually, it's, you know, the whole thing crashes, and you know, it's no one's going to mine a bitcoin if it costs you know whatever six thousand to mine one, and they're only selling for a thousand bucks or five hundred bucks. Then I guess the mining shuts so that, down until the Cost yes. comes down. Thank you, Peter. For one, again, I want to tell the audience that for, for a very special reason, that resolution says it will eventually replace government's fiat money. Now, now Erica is implying that's a redundancy, so to speak. <laughs> but I meant to put that word in precisely to finesse this issue of fiat money. It's government's fiat money, so that you are still voting on a robust resolution. It will replace government's fiat money. But uh, I, uh, moderator's prerogative to ask you a question, Peter. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the argument uh, is uh, about uh, the value of gold is that first, it trades as a monetary metal, just as Bitcoin trades as a monetary currency. But second, in the case of gold, if it no longer traded as a monetary metal, if there was no demand for it as such, it would collapse in price because its value as an ornamental industrial metal is quite limited. So that 90% of the reason for, the gold, for gold's price is exactly the same as the reason for Bitcoin's price. Well, Could you respond to that? Well, I would disagree. I mean, first of all, I don't know how you can ascertain that 90% of gold's value comes from its use as money when hardly anybody uses it as money today. Uh, it trades as a precious monetary metal. Uh, right. It responds, that's but, how it trades. That's no. the argument. Well, but that's yeah. not what it's being utilized for today. I but believe if, that's, that's how its price no, trades. It, no. That's how it trades. I don't, I don't know how it's traded. I mean, okay, it's not traded okay. for that. It's traded just Peter Schiff people. does not know, no. know how gold but you trades. Don't know that's what, a scandal. <laughs> if, Bear that in mind. If somebody... He doesn't look, know. If somebody is buying gold, you don't know. I mean, you have a lot of industry people in there that are in the gold market trading. But I would say that if gold was priced as money right now, it would be priced a lot higher than twelve hundred fifty dollars an ounce. I didn't say that, Peter. It might be ten thousand dollars an ounce. Right now, gold is basically priced for jewelry. It's not priced as money. It's not being circulated as money. It's not being saved. Central banks have some gold, but they probably have less gold now than they've ever had in, in their history. Uh, so. 
I, I don't think there's much of a monetary premium currently built into the price of gold. Peter just made a fascinating statement about gold. We might have a debate about that. P gold trades as jewelry. Fascinating it trades statement. as a commodity. Yeah, yeah. It Trade is not being... It, it doesn't change it is the not precious being, metal. Okay. It is not being traded same. right now as money. Okay, we have to stay. And people aren't, um, you know, portfolio managers aren't buying it as insurance. Nobody owns gold, right? If okay. they have want insurance, they use derivatives or they use something else. Okay, you made yourself. But, uh, well, one final question from the moderator, from my moderator's prerogative, and now so uh, having to do with with the degree to which the government can enforce uh, its will with respect to gold or with respect to Bitcoin. Uh, the, uh, the question for Eric, is especially Peter, said that uh, despite the fact that I think he sort of concedes the government can seize gold, it did. It did uh, under Roosevelt. Gold was unlawful to own, uh, and of course, obviously, it's difficult to hide gold wherever it is obviously a physical commodity, much more vulnerable. But on the other hand, Peter said, well, but they can say to banks, everybody, look, you could get caught trading Bitcoin 20 years in prison. What about that? Yeah, well, the government could absolutely outlaw Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, it's not Just as easily? Just as easily? It's, it's gold? Yeah. Well, more easily, because there would be fewer people that would resist that. Um, today, a lot of people still think that Bitcoin is just used by criminals because that's what the media likes to tell them. Um, I guess I would bring up a few points on that. One is that governments have a super poor record of successfully banning anything. They can write on paper that you're not supposed to use it. I'm not aware of any time in history where that actually works. Murder itself is banned by the government and yet people get killed all the time. Okay, just one. Peter, a question. Gold versus Bitcoin. Peter said that it's easier, in fact, for the government to outlaw Bitcoin use as money than to outlaw gold use. I, and, and I agree with that. It is do. easier to ban. It is easier to ban Bitcoin than it would be to ban gold because of popular sentiment. Enforceability. However, Enforceability. It then? would be harder to enforce it. Right? Okay, that's the key point. If yeah. you have ten million dollars and you want to move it somewhere on Earth, if it is outlawed that gold is probably not going to move. Or if it does, it's going to be a black market transaction that requires a huge amount of uh, expense in order to do that, just as it would to get drugs across the border. I can, I can send a billion dollars of Bitcoin anywhere in the world without anyone knowing about it. Yeah, but so the, problem the enforceability is, is not But the problem close. is if it's illegal, no bank is ever going to convert it into a currency. So the person you send it to is going to have to keep it and only give it to somebody else who wants the Bitcoin. But then, of course, since you're doing this all over computers, you know, governments are going to be able to track it down, figure out what address, what computer, figure the wallets out, and they can come and they can catch people. I mean, I think it's harder if somebody physically hands somebody a gold coin, unless the government is physically, you know, following you around. That transaction is more in secret than something that's done over a computer network where government agents can be monitoring the transactions and trying to figure out uh, you know, what's happened. So I, you know, I think it will be easier to, to ban Bitcoin. But I want to ask, mention one question on your gold that Gene yeah. brought up. Sure. You know, it costs, I mean, the average mine, to, to mine an ounce of gold now is, I don't know, 1,200 bucks, 11. I mean, it's expensive to mine gold. So if you thought gold was only worth $100 an ounce, nobody would be mining it. Well, and yeah. so the only gold we would have to make anything, it would be the existing gold. Lots and that. the price would have to go way up unless everybody was going to melt down their jewelry. If you wanted to make new jewelry, there'd be no new gold coming because nobody would mine it. Especially since the so, government is sitting on a billion ounces, but well, they, they won't let it go, right? Yeah, but yeah. so the, the yeah. point is there yeah. is some natural floor. I know, yeah. you know, when you talk about the cost of mining Bitcoin, that's nothing than the cost. There is a real physical cost to extracting gold from the ground, and that also creates a, a base value uh, for the metal because you know you just can't get it for free. What, 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 how many people, how, many, how much gold is hold, held by investors and speculators? Just, as, just physical gold held by investors and speculators. I don't know the quantity, but it's, uh, it's very immense. small. It, uh, very com small. Okay. Compared to what All they right. hold in stocks and bonds well, and oh, stuff oh, like that. Compared, it's a to tiny the, compared to the gold supply, the above ground gold supply, how much is it? That I don't know the exact amount. No, no, no. Okay. Do you know? Right. Yes, I do. It's, it's immense. But well, anyway, how, uh, how, how immense? Well, it's about one third. About one well, third one third? That's yeah. not that much. One so third of the entire gold supply. So two-thirds is not being held by investors. They would dump it all. <laughs> dump it all. They would dump it all. 
dump it all on the market. But well, what if people? What if all the big whales dump their Bitcoin? How many? How many? Oh, yeah, what? What yeah. percentage of Bitcoin is owned by the top hundred wallets? I was only. And how many of those wallets are owned by the same guy? I was only trying to address your issue of <laughs> intrinsic value of gold. It 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 it, it could be valued as a, mon as a as a metal that you put in your teeth or the ornamental. But that's that's far less than its price. I'm surprised that you think the price of gold only responds to jewelry demand. No, a lot of people disagree with you. I'm just saying you. that but today. Yeah. Today, there's very little investor demand for gold. I know. I sell uh, it. Yeah. You know, sales are down like 80%. No one wants gold right now. <laughs> Peter is in a bad way uh, with his business. And yeah, Bitcoin's put me out of business. <laughs> He's getting $2,000 honorarium tonight, so that's going to keep the wolf from the door. I am? Yeah. You didn't know? Yeah. No. You are. Right. I'll take it. Oh, did you it's expect more? In gold, Bitcoin, well, fiat, how am I getting paid? Fiat, fiat dollars. Only fiat. All right. Well, I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> He's a happy man now. He didn't know that. Okay. Uh, uh, Naomi, you've got a question. Yeah. Uh, so just letting you know, I've sent you a bunch of online questions. Yeah, People well, I'm going to I'm 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 go through them. But what's sure. your question? Um, my question is for both of you, actually. Um, now, Peter, would you be willing to take a Bitcoin versus gold bet with Eric Voorhees here tonight? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, well... Well, well, I mean, I think he's already betting on it, and I'm betting against it, so I don't know what the point would be of the bet. Put your money what, where your mouth is. What bet did you have in mind? Skin in the game. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> you, you guys could figure out the details yourself, but essentially you would be shorting Bitcoin, and maybe uh, you would exchange the value, like if you foresee that in the future gold is going to be worth less than the comparative prices uh, between Bitcoin and gold at the moment, then... You would uh, owe each other the, the opposite when yeah, you, I mean, whenever the bet ends. I don't know. It's hard to agree on the exact terms because Bitcoin could go up before it goes down. I mean, I have no idea what bet you want to make. No, I, I have a You could throw one out there. I, I have a doubt. I have a doubt. <laughs> simple, simple arbitrage. Uh, you you uh, Eric, go long uh, Bitcoin and short gold. Uh, Peter goes uh, long gold and short Bitcoin. And in, uh, and in 12 months, we pony up. Well, that's a tough bet. I mean, you know, Bitcoin can double any moment. You know, they collapse to zero. Eric, yes. John, John Smith will take that bet. I know he will. But the because longer the time period, the more certain I am that I'm right. 36 the months? The shorter the time period, you just Okay, don't no, know, this, you know? this is one of those, like, classic Julian you Simon bet. No, you don't how about know. Five, how about five years? How about five years, Peter? Yeah, I mean, five, five years, yes. Five years, I think. Okay, 60 months from now, we're going to meet. <laughs> <laughs> And we're, we're going to send the prices. Uh, Gold, it's, yes. It's a, it's a simple trade, and uh, you're going to put up uh, you're going to put up your entire honorarium, two thousand dollars, right. and you'll put up your two thousand dollar honorarium. As long as he doesn't put it up in Bitcoin. <laughs> put up, you know. Well, it's going to be a fair cut. We're going to arrange something. Very good suggestion, Naomi. We're going to work something out later. Next question. Hi. So much of both your discussion has been about whether Bitcoin should or should not succeed in this idea. My question is, what would it take you to become convinced of the opposite of your view in terms of, for Eric, Bitcoin will not succeed, not should not, will not. Peter, Bitcoin will succeed, not should, sorry, not should succeed. Thanks. Um, you got the question? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Play devil's advocate a little That's bit. That's a great question. Basically, what would it take for me to change my opinion that Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency would replace fiat? Um, if something better than cryptocurrency happened, right, like something that didn't use blockchains at all, but something that hasn't been invented yet that came along that seemed to be objectively better as a form of money, that could do it. Um, or if I think there was a five to 10 year period where the entire crypto market just slowly dwindled towards zero, um, I would have to like assess during that time what was the reasons for that, but that might make me change my opinion. Um, Short of that, you know, these little bubbles that go up and down every few years, they don't, they don't bother me at all. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting, too, though, Eric, you'll acknowledge that cryptocurrency might ultimately succeed, but it may not be Bitcoin. It may be some other cryptocurrency. Totally. In which case, Bitcoin would be worthless. Poss yes, totally yeah, possible. And, 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 and for that very reason, I don't think any cryptocurrency will ever succeed because I think if something can replace Bitcoin, then something will replace what replaces Bitcoin? Look, I mentioned earlier that Facebook replaced uh, MySpace. In two years, Facebook will probably still be pretty big, but judging by the fact that a lot of younger people don't use it anymore, in 20 years, nobody might use it. Nobody knows, right, what's gonna come up. And so Facebook shares, maybe they're a good speculation, but you're not gonna use it as money. Um, and, 
And as far as what could convince me, since I don't share your faith that the volatility will ever go away. See, Eric believes that at some point in time, even though Bitcoin is too volatile today to be money, that at some point in the future, it won't be volatile. I just can't make that leap of faith that the volatility is ever going to go away. I can't see that point. And I do think that if all the people who are holding Bitcoin ever got to the point where they actually thought it had topped out and was going to be stable, then they'd want to cash out. Now they'd want to start buying. You got all these people living in their parents' basements that are Bitcoin millionaires and they have nothing because they're afraid to sell because they don't want to miss out. Uh, Peter, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I, I just can't in my mind see how it can ever stop going up or stabilize without collapsing as everybody tries to cash no, out. Yeah, okay. We need to get rid of this word faith here, okay? Faith? The reason that people that are in crypto are in crypto is not because of faith. It's because they've actually used it and they've seen it work, they've read the code, they understand what it's doing. It is an assessment of a technology based on people's opinions of that technology working and using it. Some people, Not I think faith. a lot of people just own it because it's going up and they think they're gonna get rich. Uh, you can equally apply that to gold, especially after the financial Not that crisis. many people think they're gonna get rich in gold. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but they, And that's why you should be buying it. You don't buy what everybody else is buying. Um, yeah, both, both, look, both, both crypto and gold have a large degree of speculative froth around them, right? I think no, there's no speculative. There, are there some gold speculators? Yes. Is it frothy? Absolutely not. The froth is not in gold, right? There's a lot of froth in a lot of assets these days, whether it's stocks or bonds or cryptocurrencies. But believe me, there's no froth in gold. No, I, so wow. I agree with that right now. There's not a lot of froth in gold right now. But there have been bubbles in gold, just as there are bubbles in crypto. And I don't think well, it's Well, not this big. But yes, there have been periods of time, I think, where gold got overvalued. You know, 1980, when it had gone up from $35 an ounce up to 850 it was, you know, too high. And it, it pulled back, went into a long-term bear market. Um, uh, but not to the extent... The, the bubble that I think we've seen in cryptocurrencies, I think, is unparalleled. I mean, I think this is... You know, when they write the history books and about bubbles, it, you know, you have the popular delusions and madness of crowds. I mean, cryptocurrencies doesn't even need to be a chapter. It could be its own book. Um, and, you know, I, I think even if Bitcoin topped out at 20,000, it still may, the whole crypto thing might still be the biggest bubble we've ever seen. But it is possible that Bitcoin can make a new high. I'm not smart enough to know. So the bubble could, in fact, get even bigger. If we, if we looked at the price of Apple shares from the creation of that company up to today, it will have gone through bubbles and it will be at stratospheric heights compared to what it, what it was back then. Oh, bubbles, bull why, bear markets, but not why, bubbles. Why is Apple's shares not a huge speculative bubble that will crash to zero, but Bitcoin is? Well, the difference between a speculative bubble and just being overpriced, right? I mean, there, you can certainly make an argument that Apple is expensive, not based on its current mo price multiple. Based on that, Apple's you know, relatively inexpensive. But the question is, can it maintain its dominance? Can it maintain its market share in a free market where everybody is gunning for it? Everybody's trying to outdo it and make a better product, right? Build a better mousetrap. What is the odds that Apple can continue to innovate at the rate of the past and the future mm -hmm. and that its market cap will continue to grow? Eventually, no, it's going to, it's going to fall. The price is going to drop. But Apple, it, when you buy stock in Apple, you're buying into a company, you're buying into a revenue stream, you're buying all the physical and tangible assets and goodwill of the company. You get the dividend, you get, you know, but when you buy Bitcoin, you're not buying into anything other than the hype and the, the, the potential that somebody else is going to pay a higher price, right? right? The whole bubble mentality is the greater fool. I'm going to buy right. it because some greater fool is going to pay me more. And that fool is going to buy it because he's expecting a greater fool to outbid him. Well, greatest. eventually you run out of fools and you're the last fool and that's it. That's a great fool thing. Okay, we have it. Uh, uh, Peter, uh, a question, question from our vast live stream audience. Uh, this one in, uh, that picks up on the other question about the hypothetical. Uh, the technology of gold mining. Uh, the, let's say that uh, gold does get recognized more and more as money and it uh, expands its price, doubles, triples whatever. Uh, are you saying that for all time, you know, this intrinsic notion of yours that gold is always going to be expensive? Can they start mining it from asteroids? I've been told by some gold experts there's more gold in the ocean uh, than we've ever mined in the history of the world. Uh, if, you, if, if, if technology takes off and we can suddenly double and triple the gold supply uh, inside of a few months, or 
will what will that do to gold? Well, look, in terms of its scarcity, the gold supply has been growing, you know, for thousands of years. What's it, what if there's a technological leap? Look, there's there's been th we've had technological okay, leaps. Yeah. You know, we've already obviously mined the, the, the cheap gold. But look, is there gold in asteroids? Probably in the I mean, ocean. I doubt in the, in the I, ocean. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a lot of stuff in the ocean. I don't know what's down there. There's more gold but, in the ocean. There's but, more gold it, in the ocean like, than there is anywhere else. You know, go there to is. the ocean and try to get it. I but, will tell. Okay. But well, I mean, maybe that's what maybe, people are going to do. Look, maybe there's a way to. Who knows what it's going to cost? So as I start to say, maybe yeah. there's gold in asteroids. I doubt there's a an asteroid that's solid gold. I mean, gold is very rare on Earth. It's probably rare all over the universe. And so, if there's an asteroid that has some gold, there's probably not a lot of it. But believe me. If they're going to mine gold and asteroids, the price is going to be sky high because they're going to have to mine every last bit of gold on Earth before someone takes a spaceship up to an asteroid and tries to mine the gold up there and then bring it back down to Earth. I mean, that's going to be some expensive gold. And, there is, yeah. there is, there is I mean, an immense amount of gold in the ocean, just as well, a matter of fact. But yeah. that is a yeah, your question. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, just, Gene, quickly, uh, another great debate. Uh, Peter... Awesome socks. I, I really love them. Uh, okay, uh, just a, a, a quick question for, for Eric. I have a, a coworker who uh, prays at the altar of Bitcoin, and I asked him a, a basic question, and I don't think he answered it adequately, so I'll ask you. Uh, you might have touched on something that this could be, but uh, potentially, what do you think is the main obstacle that can impede the growth or the health of Bitcoin? Well, in Bitcoin's early years, the major obstacle impeding its growth was actually all the libertarians that couldn't see a good thing when it hit them. Um, I think that's finally becoming a non-issue anymore. Uh, Bitcoin has grown much larger than the libertarian community around the world. And I think at this point, um, the biggest impediment to its adoption is simply that most individuals still want governments to manage money for them. Um, until that changes, Bitcoin, I think, will always be playing second fiddle. But I bet on Bitcoin largely because I know that the history of money is full of governments losing control over their fiats. And there has never been a financial crisis in which cryptocurrency actually existed. The next time that happens, uh, I know where a lot of the people are going to be going. And so that's what I'm waiting for. Yeah, I think it's it's very interesting, you know, that you know, the, obviously the libertarian community, other than maybe criminals, were the first to embrace uh, Bitcoin. But what's interesting is all of the properties that the libertarians found so appealing have actually been lost in the effort to you know bring more people into the into the bubble and and mainstream it for the institutional investors. All the regulation, the government getting involved. I mean, now you want to open up an account, all the KYC of a bank account. They need your passport. They need your uh, your driver's license, a utility bill. You know, the transaction costs have gone up. The government oversight. It's, it's not now this thing that you're operating underneath the radar, right? You're free from the banking system and the and, and, the, and Big Brother watching your transactions. And gone are the days where it costs next to nothing to transfer, you know, the Bitcoin because the transaction costs have gone up. So I think Bitcoin has lost a lot of that appeal in order to get the hedge funds involved and the big money in. And I think the... I mean, this is great for the libertarians who got in early, and now they have you know somebody to sell to. They have it; they can cash out. Um, but if they actually stop and think, what Bitcoin has become is not what they originally embraced. It's something entirely different. It's what they argued against. So, totally disagree with that. Bitcoin, <laughs> Bitcoin has absolutely grown, and many more people are involved now than than they used to be, and and a much higher portion of those people are no longer libertarian types. And that's okay. That's kind of all part of the plan. To say that Bitcoin has lost its properties that made it useful in the beginning is simply not true. Well, not really useful. Well, hold on. Hold kind on, of Peter. attracted the libertarians hold on. to it. Now it's all the greed and all, yeah, but to get rich. Okay. That has happened both in gold and crypto. So I don't think that that's, that's any different there. There is no government in the world that knows how many Bitcoins I have. That was true in 2011, and it's true today, and it'll be true 10 years from now. But gold, gold has never been about getting rich. Gold is about not becoming poor, right? Gold is about preserving... Wait, no. Gold is about preserving wealth. It's a, it's a store of value. It is not a get-rich-quick scheme. 
People are not buying Bitcoin today to store anything or preserve anything. People are buying Bitcoin because they think the price is going to go up. So they're trying to accumulate wealth by owning Bitcoin. People buy gold in order to preserve the wealth they've already accumulated. Okay. Are you saying that there's not a single person that owns Bitcoin that did it for anything other than speculative fervor? No, I'm saying initially a lot of people got in for all sorts of reasons. But I would say that most of the people who have bought Bitcoin in the last six months to a year, most of those people were motivated solely by profit. Gold has never, never been about getting rich. Okay, but the question... If you're panning for gold in the ocean, you're trying to get rich. But okay, just okay fair enough. Money, okay. You're buying it as a store of value, as a conservative way to protect... It's it. only what we saw in Deadwood. Okay, I agree with that. But, but, but the question... Okay, uh, I'm sorry, a, a big final question. Could you finally address this question uh, that uh, Peter's challenged? The scarcity of Bitcoin. He said there's all, there's all these forks having to do with Bitcoin. So is Bitcoin only 21 million ounces, or is Peter right, that with all those forks and whatever, there's a lot more than 21 million going to be involved? No, there's there's yeah. only 21 million Bitcoin. There can never be more than But what about the forks? The forks. That's like a lot. not Bitcoin. Just as silver is not gold, just as iron is not gold, Litecoin, Dash, and Monero were not Bitcoin. Okay, unfortunately. But there's no real difference. Okay. They're all the same property. I mean, okay. there's a big no, difference no, between gold and silver. Just well, gold factually gold. incorrect. Okay, okay. Unfortunately. What can I do with... All right, well, if I, was on a, if I was on a desert island with my Litecoin, what could I do with it that I can't do with my Bitcoin? You can do about as much as you could do with gold on a desert no, island. No, I can do a lot with gold on a desert island. Oh, okay. I can, I can melt it into a bowl. It's the old economist joke. Assume, that I, find. Assume, I can bash something with it. You know. Time for that economist joke. Assume we have a can opener. <laughs> the economist on a desert island. But that aside, guys, you were great. Uh, and you are going to now finally be able to give the final bashing in the five minute <laughs> of summation. And uh, so, Peter, as the negative, you go last. And uh, Eric uh, has uh, five minutes to sum up. Take it away, Eric. Take the podium. All right, this has been fun. Um, so I first learned about Bitcoin in 2011. I fell in love with it both as a fascinating economic experiment and as one of the greatest tools ever invented for the advancement of human liberty. I wrote an article in May of 2011 called, the separation, called Bitcoin and the Separation of Money and State. In that article, I asked, why are Bitcoins valuable? And I answered by saying that they simply possessed those attributes of money that are most desired. Bitcoin was $3, and almost nobody knew about it or cared about it. A year later, I wrote another article called Bitcoin, the Libertarian Introduction. This article pointed out that if a marketplace tends to choose the medium of exchange which best works as money, and Bitcoin's specific attributes make it excellent money, then perhaps the marketplace will, over time, increasingly use it for such. By then, Bitcoin had risen over 100% to $7. A year later, in May of 2013, I gave a speech at the San Jose Bitcoin Conference called The Role of Bitcoin as Money. Once again, I argued that Bitcoin's properties would lead it to keep gaining market share against fiat. By then, Bitcoin had risen more than 1,000% to over $150, clearly a bubble, as Peter said, later that year. In December of that year, I got to have my first debate with Peter Schiff on his podcast. Yet again, I stated that the technology was immensely valuable and that Bitcoin's utility as an unblockable global payment network meant that it would keep growing. By then, Bitcoin had risen another 500% to over $800. Again, Peter called it a bubble, a beanie baby fad, a Ponzi scheme. He actually said that it was no better than fiat. Fast forward to today, even after the crash from December's frothy highs, Bitcoin is yet 800% higher still at $6,000. Every major financial institution and government in the world is studying this right now. This year's Davos may have well been called blockchains, how worried should we be? At what, point, at what point do I get to call scoreboard here? This isn't some sci-fi future thing anymore. Crypto is currently pulling in the global financial system and restructuring it through a process of free market metamorphosis. And it is about damn time that we had free markets again. Look, I can sit here and tell you guys all the cool features of Bitcoin, which I have been doing for seven years. But when it comes to the resolution being made tonight, there is really just one most critical point to understand. And that is this. Bitcoin cannot be debased. It cannot be debased, and it is now competing with the incumbent currency, US dollar fiat, which not only can be debased, but exists in a state of perpetual institutionalized debasement. 
This dynamic will encourage a virtuous cycle in which rational actors at the margins decide to hold the non-decaying form of money to the exclusion of that which decays. This is the primary reason gold itself has retained its position in society. It cannot be debased by governments either. When comparing two potential monetary alternatives, the one which is the hardest to debase is probably the one you should prefer, other factors being equal. But here the other factors aren't equal. One of them can also be transferred anywhere on Earth between any two people instantly at near zero cost and can't be shut down or censored. How is that for intrinsic value? But ignore for a moment every interesting advantage of Bitcoin. Ignore the ease with which one can send it. Ignore the censorship resistance. Ignore the universality, the fungibility, and the divisibility. Ignore the impossibility of counterfeit. True, Bitcoin surpasses US dollar fiat in all of these, but ignore those for a moment. Focus purely on the fact, the mathematical fact, that Bitcoin cannot be debased no matter how many guns a government wields, no matter how much propaganda it spews, or innocent people it imprisons. It does not matter how many meetings the Federal Reserve holds in its halls of chiseled marble. Every year, fiat oozes from the sewer of state. As consequence, it has lost 98% of its value in the past 100 years. How foolish does one need to be to hold it over the next 100? Compared to gold, Bitcoin provides an efficient digital apparatus of payment and exchange that can enable commerce rather than hinder it. But more importantly, compared to fiat, Bitcoin bestows a gift for which humanity will grow increasingly hungry, an open, honest financial system that is under the control of no man, committee, or nation. Bitcoin will find its way into every tributary of economic activity, and with this gradual adoption, Bitcoin will come to replace fiat as the preferred money and medium of exchange for all sovereign people on Earth. Well, as I admitted before, of all the bubbles that I have not participated in during my career, the one I most regret is Bitcoin. I mean, clearly, if there was ever a bubble that was tailor-made for me, that was the one, right? Um, but just because the bubble has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger doesn't change the nature of what it is. And the fact that you are right now, that there is so much attention being paid to Bitcoin. That wasn't being paid to it when it was $3 a coin, but it is being paid to it now. I think back in December when it was making its peak and the futures were debuting, uh, I was talking on my podcast and I, I decided to rename CNBC uh, Crypto News Bitcoin because that's all they talked about. It was nonstop. Of course, they won't have me on to criticize it. They won't have anyone on to criticize it. All they have is one person after another talking about how great it is and how it's gonna keep going up. And I would suggest that when you have such mainstream, you know, buying that you've probably reached a peak. I mean, I brought my high school son here. He's got his friend here from high school, and they both own Bitcoin, although my son was smart enough to sell his. He sold his at 1900, so don't clap. <laughs> but his friend still has his. But when the high school kids are buying it, look, it's not the bottom anymore. People still try to tell me, it's the ground floor. Buy your Bitcoins now because they're going to a million. Look, you know. They, I could, just because I didn't buy them at three bucks or 50 bucks or 1,000 bucks or 5,000 bucks doesn't mean I'm gonna make the mistake of succumbing to the greed and buying into them now because that's how all bubbles die. First, you have the skeptics, you know, they don't wanna buy it and then eventually they capitulate, they throw in the towel, their greed overwhelms them and they buy in and, and you make a top and the market's gonna collapse. And that's what's going to happen. I have a pretty good track record of seeing these bubbles, whether it's in uh, the real estate market or the dot-com market. I mean, this if it looks like a bubble, quacks like a bubble, walks like a bubble, it's a bubble. You talk about debasing, that Bitcoin can't be debased. The whole term debasement comes from taking a precious metal and, and coin and then putting a base metal into it so you don't really get as much gold as you thought you were getting because you've got some lesser metal instead. Well, you can't debase Bitcoin because there's nothing to debase. There's no value there to start with. It doesn't matter if you had some other cryptocurrency because you've got nothing. And it doesn't matter you know, whether you know, I, I don't have all the Bitcoin that I thought I have because at the end of the day, there's, there's nothing there. I don't think that the current fiat system will withstand the test of time. I mean, fiat money has been tried and failed all throughout history. I don't think this giant experiment is gonna succeed any better. As Eric mentioned earlier, we've only been on this fiat system since 1971. 
when the US went off the gold standard, and prior to that, we convinced everybody to be on a dollar standard. But the reason the world held dollars was because the dollar was backed by gold, and not only backed by gold, but convertible on demand into gold. And so I think this experiment is going to end. It has done incredible amounts of damage. So I think it's going away, but I don't think we're going to go to Bitcoin or any of these other fiat cryptocurrencies. I think we will go back to where we were. I think the dollar will once again be backed by gold at some point, at some exchange rate, you know, and maybe there will be um, private companies that will compete with governments by issuing cryptocurrencies backed by something. I happen to think it's best to back them by gold, but somebody could back them by some other commodity. As long as you have money that's backed with something of stable, reliable value that you can relate to other goods and services, then it could be the basis of medium exchange. I mean, modern technology does make it easier today. I would think that gold today, with the technology that exists, is easier for gold to function as money than at any point in human history. And that is the real advancement that we have. Whether it's blockchain or anything else, it's the ability to digitally transfer stored gold around the world, right? That's what is the evolution or the advancement of money. It's the improvement on what works. You don't need to reinvent something that works. Gold has worked uh, as money since it was first created. In fact, the most prosperous period in American history was when we were on the purest gold standard in American history. And I think that hopefully America will uh, re-embrace that monetary heritage once again, and hopefully the rest of the world will also enjoy the benefits of sound money and move off of the you know, constant booms and busts associated with fiat money. And I think it's ironic that one of the booms and busts is in uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And I think that the crypto bubble is going to pop before the overall fiat bubble pops. And if anything, it actually might end up uh, achieving the opposite of its purpose because it actually might succeed in doing the one thing that you shouldn't be able to do. It'll actually succeed in making fiat money look good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Eric, for your superb insights. Uh, again, the resolution reads, Bitcoin or a similar form of cryptocurrency will eventually replace government's fiat money, government's fiat money, as the preferred medium of exchange. Uh, and so we're going to open the, close, uh, open the final vote. We are ready to close the vote, so could you bring me the results? And uh, I will give it the expert style. OK. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Um, uh, the uh, the resolution was uh, again Bitcoin will or eventually replace government's fiat money as a preferred medium of exchange. Uh, the yes votes started forty percent and rose to fifty five percent in the final. So uh, Eric, so your side, Eric, picked up fifteen points. That's the number to beat. Uh, uh, Peter did not beat that number, uh, went from 40% a little bit down to 31. So, Eric, you get the Tootsie Roll. Congratulations. Congratulations to you. Guys.